That's great. Sounds great. All right, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Rana El Kalyubi. I'm Affectiva's co founder and CEO. Uh, I want to start with a shout out to uh, st the Stex program. We're a proud Stex alum company, and it's been wonderful to be part of this ecosystem. Uh, it's been very helpful, both commercially and just being able to connect with other MIT spin outs. Um, so a little bit about Affectiva. We spun out of MIT Media Lab almost 10 years ago. We are on a mission to humanize technology and AI in particular. Um, a lot of the focus on AI is uh, to give AI more IQ or cognitive intelligence. Our goal is to mimic human intelligence where your EQ or your emotional and social intelligence is just as important. And so we are building um, using deep learning and machine learning and computer vision and speech analytics algorithms that can understand all things human. Um, there's a lot of applications of this technology. We actually believe that this is going to become the de facto way we communicate with our devices um, using perception and conversation and um, emotional intelligence. Um, so there's a lot of applications at Affectiva. We have uh, over and over brought a number of products to market. We started with advertising research uh, where we have a product that quantifies how people respond to online video ads in real time just using the camera on your phone. This product is deployed in over 87 countries. We partner with 25% of the Fortune 500 companies globally to test their ads worldwide. It's very profit generating. Um, but a few years ago, we took a step back and we said, OK, that's, you know, is that it? Is that we're going to stop there? And we decided we're not. And we um, have since identified automotive and adjacent markets like social robotics and conversational interfaces as our next big market opportunities. We've raised over $50 million of both venture and strategic funding, and we have continued to innovate. So uh, we pioneered the space of emotion AI. It's a subcategory within the AI space. It's recognized by Gartner as a multi-billion dollar industry. Um, we actually created the name. We coined the term. We seeded the market. We evangelized it. We kind of created use cases for emotion AI. And we're doing it all over again for human perception AI, which is this broader category of understanding all things human. Um, so I wanted to focus my talk today on how do we create an entrepreneurial culture? We turned 10 this year, which I know for a startup sounds like an eternity. <laughs> but we're proud of everything we've built. And I think there are a number of best practices that I believe as a culture and as a company has, have helped us stay entrepreneurial. Um, and I think some of these best practices apply to young startups as well as big organizations as well. I want to do a quick show of hands. How many kind of identify with being at a startup? Okay, and how many are at larger organizations? Okay, and then academia is the rest, I assume, like if you're an academic kind. Okay, interesting. All right, the first um, best practice or key learning for me is just hire the right people. And for us, that is people with a can-do attitude. One of our core values as a company is to get shit done. <laughs> and we, we take that very seriously. And for us, these are people who can be flexible. They have a growth mindset. They're willing to wear multiple um, hats. I always say at a startup, there's so much more stuff that needs to get done than hands that can do it. So we need people who will raise their hands and they'll say, you know what, it's not really my job, but I'm, I'm game to fill in the gap. Our chief operations officer, he is also our VP of engineering, and he is the product manager for one of our key products. It's a lot, um, and we're fixing that. <laughs> but, uh, but again, the way, the way he approached it, he said, what does the company need me to do, and I'll do it. Um, our, prod our product managers also kind of double down as project managers. Again, not a great idea, but for a temporary kind of filling a gap approach, it's very helpful. I want to kind of highlight one specific example. So a number of years ago, um, we kind of realized that we're starting a new ecosystem of partners who are interested in this space of emotion AI. And so um, we were wondering, like, what would it take to start our own summit or conference? Now, as you all know, it's a lot of hard work to create that. And we had a marketing team of exactly two people, our CMO and our director of marketing. But I challenged them and I said, you know, go figure it out. And they put an amazing event together. Um, this year is going to be our third annual summit. It's mid-October uh, um, in the State Street, just across the river. 
Um, so I invite you all to attend. But that's another example of a can-do attitude. There is probably a hundred different reasons why we shouldn't have done um, the conference or we couldn't have done the conference. Um, but my team just jumped on the opportunity and they made it happen. So hire the right people. The second is to empower that team to own and execute projects and initiatives. This is very important. I am a big believer, for, first of all, everybody at Affectiva is an equity holder. So everybody owns some percent of the company and has some you know, feeling of ownership for, for the company. I think that's really important. I also am a true believer of collective intelligence. Um, so we're very transparent as a company. Uh, because I believe that if people have the right context across the entire organization, they'll be empowered to make decisions that make sense. So as a result, we have a weekly meeting. It's a hands-on deck meeting. Um, people are encouraged to ask any form of questions. I share a lot of updates. Last year, we were raising a new round of funding, and I committed to being very transparent with the team for better or worse. And so once a week, you know, for the I'd say six months of last year was spent like on roadshows pitching to investors, but once a week I would show up and I would share exactly where we were with the financing, which was tough, and it's, I think it's quite unusual, actually. Um, there were times when I'd say, oh, we met with this investor, and you know, it was really exciting. I think they're going to invest. And then next week I'll be like, they passed. <laughs> um, so I think, I, I do believe that this kind of transparency builds ownership, it builds commitment, and it makes people empowered to... Um, execute. I often get asked what am I most proud of in kind of founding and running Affectiva and for me it's the team investing in the team's professional and personal growth and I think again that builds a lot of go goodwill. Um, and I'll highlight a couple of examples. So Jay here uh, is our VP of AI. This picture is with his wife and his daughter Winter. Um, his son's not in the picture. Jay started at Affectiva nine years ago. He was fresh out of school. He was a junior machine learning scientist. Over the years, he progressed in his career, and he now runs the entire machine learning team, which, would, as you imagine, for Affectiva is the core of what we do. Um, a number of years ago, Jay you know, came to me really panicked, and he said his wife um, got a job on the West Coast, and that he, you know, he's, he expects to resign. And I was like, why are you gonna resign? Just work out through the Bay Area. <laughs> so, so I think this kind of flexibility and supporting people's careers and both professional and personal goals in life is really critical. And um, that has just built a ton of loyalty um, at the company and we're very proud of that. Umang here, um, he uh, got married last year in India. He invited a number of us to attend his wedding. I was able to fly over there with my son and my mom. Uh, it was a really um, um, special event, and um, his wife now works at Affectiva, too. It's her first time in the U.S. Okay, this one's very important. Um, you may have been following the AI space. Um, one of the main concerns um, in kind of building these AI systems is accidentally building bias or perpetuating bias into these algorithms. And that is a real problem. It's especially a big problem because people design for the things they know. Um, and so if you have a homogeneous team of AI scientists who are mostly you know, white male engineers in their 20s, there's going to be a lot of blind spots. Um, and so we're very big on diversity and inclusion. We take that very seriously. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we, we're, we're, we're focused on automotive, and one of our um, um, German um, partners, um, automakers, they, we have a proof of concept with them, they're collecting some data, um, and we, saw, we got access to that data, and it was literally, they were collecting data from Poland, and it was all, like, there were no women, it was all guys, and they were all white, young guys. And I was like, that's not gonna work. If we use that data set to train and validate our algorithms, it's gonna be very biased, which is, which is a key problem for a global automaker like this particular partner of ours. Um, and so we went back and we said, you know what, this doesn't work. We had to educate them about bias and we had to actually augment their data with our own global data strategy. Um, and we, I think this would not have been possible if as a team we weren't really thinking through um, the diversity and the importance of diversity and also had different perspectives around the table. Diversity isn't just gender and ethnicity. For me, it's also age. We have an internship program for... Um, you know, for postgrads and undergrads, we actually 
partner very closely with MIT, but we also extended it to high school students. <clears throat> and I like to laugh because the acceptance rate for that program is pretty much like the acceptance rate to MIT and Harvard. It's about 6%. It's crazy the amount of interest that these kids have um, in trying to um, partake in some of, the, of these opportunities to get exposed to the AI space. Um, they've been wonderful. We put them on mission critical projects. Um, and um, you know, I, I, I think it's win-win. We really affect how they think about the world, but they've been able to share their own unique perspectives as well. So prioritize diversity and inclusion. It's really critical. <clears throat> Actually, sorry, losing my voice. <clears throat> um, yeah, what is, what is really especially critical actually with diversity and inclusion, it's not only the right thing to do ethically and morally, for us it's table stakes because it does translate into how we design um, and evaluate these algorithms and if they're biased, then our technology is just not gonna work in, in practice. Number five, have a person, a purpose and be mission driven. This is really critical and it's been very helpful for us, so our mission is to humanize technology. We're very, uh, we have very strong core values around where we would deploy this technology and where we won't. We don't do lie detection and surveillance and security. Um, and we found that this is a very powerful magnet for attracting talent and also partners. Like we've been selected by a number of investors and business partners because of our strong mission and our strong, strong commitment to um, ethical core values. Um, so again, this is an example where it has to be authentic, and for us, you know, this was, um, these core values were identified from day one, um, but, it's, but, but I encourage you to kind of think really hard about what is that purpose and, and be able to articulate it in a way that resonates with people. And then last but not least, build a support network and ignore the naysayers. I want you to picture this. So 10 years ago, um, my co-founder, Professor Rosalind Picard at the MIT Media Lab and myself, uh, did a whole Sandhill Roadshow where we were raising initial seed money for the company. Um, so two women scientists, at the time I used to wear the hijab, and we were pitching for an emotion company, <laughs> mostly to older white guys. Uh, it, was pretty, it was pretty challenging. There were a lot of naysayers. I mean, everybody we met was very respectful, um, often very intrigued by the technology, but it was so risky. It was so different than the, what they were used to seeing. Um, so it was quite hard uh, to raise money. There was one particular day when um, I had my eight-month-old baby, Adam. He's now 10. And um, I had hired a babysitter for him in the Bay Area, and she uh, bailed out last minute. And so I was like, what are we going to do? We have this investor meeting. So I brought him along in the car seat, asked the um, executive assistant who was sitting at the front desk to, you know, take care of him <laughs> while I did the pitch and just like prayed that he doesn't make any noises or anything. It all worked out. We were able to raise um, money from awesome top tier investors over the years. Um, so my message is just to persevere. Sometimes it's not going to be very easy, but if you believe in your mission and your passion, you're going to find like-minded people who believe in it too. Um, and yeah, we're hiring. We just raised a new round of financing, so uh, we're hiring very aggressively. Join our team. Thank you. Do you want to just take the questions as well? Or? Sure. Um, shall I read the questions? Yeah, go ahead. OK, we have a number of questions. You mentioned age diversity. Do you include older people? Do you include older people, many of whom have little or no experience with computers, much less AI or social media? Absolutely, we do. Um, in fact, my senior executive team, Andy, Gabby, and Tim, they are, uh, well, Andy's not much older than I am, but both Tim and Gabby are, and they have a ton of experience in the startup business, uh, in, in startups, but also larger organizations. Both um, worked at IBM for many, many years, and so I, I believe varied experiences is very critical. Gabby's actually, uh, she has a background in art history, um, so not AI, um, but uh, very, it's important to bring these different perspectives. All right, what have you personally found most challenging about running an entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial company? Hmm. You know, for me, it isn't about, it's kind of interesting actually, it isn't, um, it isn't the technology, 
It isn't the product market fit. For me, it's people. It's getting everybody aligned on the same page and kind of rowing in the same direction. Um, I found that quite challenging. Um, even at times where you think that everybody's on the same page, everybody has kind of their own unique interpretation of our goals and our, uh, and our aspirations, and that's been challenging. Okay, Eric has a question. What specific challenges have you faced in keeping the culture as the company grows? <sighs> yeah, that's, that's actually a good question. So as I said, we just raised a new round of funding, so we grew from about um, 30 people in the US to about 45, and we're continuing to hire. And in, in Cairo, we doubled our team. Um, so in total, we're about 100 people now. Um, I think it's an opportunity to kind of rethink what we care about in our culture, but also reset some of the things that I think you know, we don't do or haven't been doing very well. Um, for me, it's just really hiring people who share our vision and share our core values of integrity and hardworking and, and, and collaboration and partnership. Um, so yeah, um, I don't know if I have specific actions, um, but just thinking about it and prioritizing it, for me, culture is really critical. So I'm always thinking about it, talking about it. We actually have, OK, that's a specific example. We have in our weekly meeting what we call the rock star nomination. Um, so people, you know, your peers basically nominate you for something you've done where you've demonstrated one of the core values of the company. We do that every week, and it's just a great way to you know, bring these core values to life. They're not just like, you know, they're, just, they're not just words we put on our website. We actually practice them and we, um, you know, we, we reinforce them. Your example of ignoring naysayers was an external one. How do you support here and convince internal ones? Ooh, that is a good one. I, okay, I'll give a very specific example. We got invited to participate in a, an RFQ, a request for a quote by uh, uh, an American, a US-based automaker. Um, and I think we shouldn't, I mean, I think it's a great business opportunity. We should not forgo it. My team disagrees. Um, they've done all the numbers, they've looked at all the resourcing, and they really think we can't fit it in this year. We've gone back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. I guess I could veto it. Right? I could say, guys, we're just gonna get, you know, we're just gonna do it. But I actually, in this particular case, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, like, go with the team's um, analysis, and, and basically, we're gonna forego this business. So I think it goes two ways, both ways. I'll, I'll sometimes listen, and I'll sometimes try to convince, and I'll sometimes persuade, and occasionally I'll veto. Not a lot. Okay. Have you partnered with healthcare companies on Emotion AI? Um, healthcare is one of the areas where this technology can be truly transformative. We know that there are facial and vocal biomarkers of things like depression, suicide. The very first use case we explored was autism at MIT. Um, it's a very tough industry to penetrate. Um, and so it's not an industry we're focused on right now, but if you have any ideas on how we could do that, I'm, I'm, we turned 10, as I said. And one of the things I really want to get up and running this year is kind of a, an AI for good or emotion AI for good initiative. And that's where maybe um, the healthcare partnerships can be under that umbrella. Uh, if you have any ideas or any advice or suggestions, please, please, please come talk to me. It's something I'm extremely passionate about. OK, what are some challenges you see working with corporates? And what difference in culture are most challenging? Yeah. Um, we, we, most of our strategic partners, actually, and commercial partners are big companies. Um, automotive companies is, is one example. What I found is some of the recipes for success, you have to find a champion inside these companies that's a believer. They're going to put their careers on the line to bring your technology into this large organization. Um, and the more champions, the more internal, internal champions you have, the more successful you're going to be. Um, and I found that there are just some companies who want to be on the forefront. Like, for example, we partner very closely with Unilever. They were one of the very first users of our technology in, in understanding people's responses to advertising. They're on the forefront. They wanted to deploy it. They wanted to benchmark it worldwide. And so now they, they actually have the largest facial coding data in the world because they were very early adopters. Um, and then there are other companies who are quite skeptical. They just don't get it, or they'll find 100 reasons not to, not to kind of engage or pilot it. 
how much of your time do you spend uh, seeking funding and recruiting? Um, a lot. I, I, I think one of my main roles is uh, chief evangelist, and, and that's just an ongoing job. I'm always meeting investors, building relationships. What I did find is the best way, or th the investors we ended up actually getting money from last year, the 26 million we just raised, were people we had built a relationship with over you know, the last few years. Um, and so that, that's actually a key takeaway. Um, kind of cultivate these relationships over time because when you need them, they'll be there. All right. With that, all righty. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much, Rana. That was amazing. Thank you. Really appreciate that. Thank you. Appreciate that.